Next up on stage, Open Philanthropy founder Holden Karnofsky in conversation with platformer newsletter author Casey Newton. Goodbye. Thank you for that warm ovation. How's everybody doing? Great. Oh, you don't have to do that. All right, I enjoyed it, I'll be honest. Look, now I know y'all have been having a lot of fun talking about business and making money, but it's time to get serious, okay? Can we get serious for a minute in here? All right, I heard one person say yes, we're gonna go with it. So, hold it. In February, you stepped away from responsibilities as CEO of Open Philanthropy to focus full-time on AI safety. What drove that decision for you? Sure. Um, I've been working on this for several years. So Open Philanthropy uh, is a foundation that tries to find the most important, neglected, and tractable causes uh, to work in and to do the most good possible by doing that. And so it's been my job for a while to try to find causes to work on that, that are not getting enough attention for how important they are. And as part of that, I became convinced a few years ago that AI just has this enormous potential for incredible benefits, but also incredible risks. I wrote a piece online. You can Google the most important century. It's it's called The Most Important Century, and it's about how, you know, imaginably advanced AI could be sort of the, the second species in the history of the universe, as far as we know, that can do what humans do, uh, specifically that can develop its own technology, that can automate the process of scientific and technological advancement. And if we ended up with that kind of AI, that might just be sort of the you know, the last or the most important thing that humanity had a chance to shape. So that's, a, that's just a sense of the, of the general stakes that I perceive. And so for a while, I have been working to get out of my role as CEO of Open Philanthropy. Alexander Berger recently took over as CEO and just go full-time into working on AI in a way that hopefully we're able to realize the tremendous possible benefits, but also get ahead of what I think are, are risks, you know, beyond, beyond what most people are, are tracking. All right, so you say there are a lot of potential benefits to AI, but earlier this week you told me that you maybe lean more pessimistic on this subject than maybe some of the people in this room. So tell us about what it is that makes you lean more pessimistic with regard to AI. Sure. I mean, it's it's all relative. I think compared to some people, I'm quite optimistic. But I, I generally no, think No, you're that... not. I know a lot of people. You're okay. more pessimistic than most people. <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you. I can introduce you to some people who are okay. more pessimistic than I am. Yeah. You've probably heard of them. They'll a be at the after them. party later. Yeah. I mean, one one way of putting it is I, you know, let's let's say, and and I think this this would be probably a lower bound for me, but let's say that we're gonna have uh, we're gonna build this incredibly powerful AI, which which is a question mark, may not happen, but let's say we humanity build this incredibly powerful AI that's able to do roughly everything humans do, at least at least everything humans do to advance science and technology, and. You know, any economic model will tell you, and, and I think there's other reasons to think that that could lead to just an incredible explosion in progress that I think goes goes past exciting and, and, and solidly on the way to scary. And so... But well, why? Yeah, why? yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, why? So, so first off, so, so imagine, you know, imagine a world that might be 10,000 years from now or 1,000 years from now. And the, the concern I have, and also it's exciting too, is that you could reach that world in like years or months um, if you had automated scientific and technological advancement. So what are some ways that could go bad? Well, one way is balance of power. So one country or one company or one institution having a few month lead in AI that could turn into like a hundreds of years lead in all technology. That's the kind of thing that could, you know, could be quite an advantage uh, for one country or another, could be a very good thing, could be a very bad thing. You know, another thing is if, if we have AIs that themselves have been trained in a way that they are trying to maximize something or optimize something or have some sort of goal that is not what we intended, then you have something that, that may be just technologically far more advanced and far more capable than humans with some vision for the world that may or may not include us, may or may not be the world we want, and we end up completely losing control of the world. And to put numbers on it, I mean, let's, let's say I thought it was 90% that this is all going to be glorious. We're going to get this technologically advanced future that I think, that I really do think could be amazing, and a 10% chance that we're going to get something bad, something like just, I don't know, a world that's that's full of AIs that have been trained to seek digital signals of approval, and so now they're just trying to create as many digital signals of approval as they can, and humans are kind of a sideshow or out of the way. And if it was 90-10, I think that would be a really good case for saying, you know what, it would be better to go slow, be careful, and accept that we may get these benefits later to make sure that we drive that risk down from 10% to more like 1%. 
Right. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not good at math. I, I know that, you know, 10% is a relatively low chance, but in the grand scheme of things, it does mean that, like, one time, one time out of 10, we do get the worst case scenario. Something like that. Right. And do you think we're in the, the one case out of 10 scenario right now? Well, I just have no idea. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm looking forward, and I'm kind of like, it looks like at least, at least one in 10 that we get something really bad. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So you've been investigating potential solutions to this issue, and you one of the things you've been exploring is the idea of red lines. What are red lines? Yeah, the idea of a red line is, is there's some sort of agreement or pre-commitment in advance that says, when we see that AI systems are capable of X or Y, scary thing, dangerous thing, at that point, we'll need to make sure that we have certain pre-agreed protections in place, or we're going to have to stop advancing AI until we do. And so just a very tangible example would be there's a lot of debate over whether future AIs, because current AIs, I think, cannot do this, but maybe a future AI would be able to walk a terrorist through how to build a viable bioweapon. This is something a bunch of humans could do if they wanted to. Most humans don't want to do this, but a few do. If an AI could walk a human through doing that, if we had systems like that, it would be very important to keep them under good enough information security that it would be very hard for someone to steal the weights. And so an example of a red line would, would say, if we have AIs that show that capability and we don't yet have that level of information security, which is the kind of thing it could take years to put in place, then we have to stop pushing forward AI until we have the security in place. That's an example. Got it. Give us some other examples of red lines that you would like to, to see set that would give you some more peace of mind. Yeah, for sure. So that's a big one. There's this idea of uh, self-replication or autonomous replication and adaptation. So there's a, you know, it's all very nascent. It's all people coming up with, with very early frameworks for assessing AI risk. But you can take an AI system today and you can try to prompt it to go through a loop of sort of making money for itself, plowing the money back into hardware that it can use to run more copies of itself, and basically like sustaining and replicating itself, uh, and doing all the steps needed to do that in the face of like normal variation in the world. And there have been tests uh, run by you know by organizations like Archivals on this, and so far. That is not something that, that any of today's AI systems are able to do. But if they were, that creates another situation where you might say, hey, if we have an AI that could do that, we really need to make sure that no one is stealing the weights of this system and causing some kind of loop that ends we don't know where. And we probably need an even higher standard for information security for that than we would need for the bioweapon because we may want to worry about, you know, about governments stealing the AI at that point. So that's an example. Um, a third one that, that I, I think is very important is... AI R&D itself, so I think if it, we could imagine, and again, we don't have AI systems that could do this today, but we could imagine a future world in which you have AIs that are automating AI research, and then you could just blow through a lot of the other red lines that you were worried about extremely quickly, and so that's one that I think it would be great to pre-agree, hey, we have to be extremely incredibly careful with systems that are able to do that. If we were able to come up with these red lines, if we were able to measure reliably for them, I feel like we could be moving forward, realizing a lot of the benefits and, and have reduced a lot of the risks. All right, I want to take a, a moment to sort of pull the room and see who who's listening to this thinks that they're, they're sort of as worried as Holden is about the, the, this, uh, <laughs> the potential danger of this world and how many people think it's all going to be fine. So just by a show of hands, who is on the side of like, yes, I'm really worried about th these sort of scenarios unfolding? I'm seeing what I would describe as very few hands. How many people uh, are convinced that it's basically going to be fine? Okay. I would say we have some optimists in the room. Cool. Uh, so that's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So how would these red lines work, Holden? Sure. Um, like, is it the government that sets them, or do we just hope that the yeah. industry self-regulates? Well, it could be set by anyone. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, looking for, for anyone who's interested, anyone who will listen to, to adopt red lines. But a lot, of, a lot of what I have focused on is responsible scaling policies, which would be company policies, that an AI company would voluntarily say, hey, we're going to test for this stuff, and if we see it, we have to make sure we have the right protections in place, and if we don't see it, we can keep going. Mm -hmm. And to the point that, I mean, it, you know, things vary a lot by what room you're in, but to the point, yeah, there's a lot of disagreement with my views in this room, and that's fine, but a lot of this framework is designed to bring together people who disagree on exactly this sort of thing. So if you don't think that AIs are going to be useful for bioweapons development anytime in the next 10 years, then testing for that and pre-committing to certain protections when you see it is very cheap. You don't have to do much. You just run some tests and you keep going as you were going. Um, then if it turns out you were wrong and I was right, I think we're hopefully all going to be very glad that we put these pre-commitments in place. If it turns out you were right and I was wrong, then we did pay a bit, bit of a tax with the testing, but hopefully didn't lose too much. So th this, this idea of responsible scaling policies and more broadly red lines is designed to have a broader coalition than just people who are worried.
Got it. And have you started to have these conversations with, with folks in the industry or folks in the government yet? What, what kind of reception are you getting? Yeah, sure. So I've talked about it. I mean, fact about me is I'm, I'm married to Daniela Amade, uh, the president of Anthropic, and I have a number of contacts at a bunch of the different AI companies, and I have talked to them about it. And there has, yeah, there has been a fair amount of interest. I mean, Anthropic has put out an initial responsible scaling policy. OpenAI has announced that they're working on something similar that they're calling a risk-informed development policy. So yeah, I think that the basic premise is that a lot of people who may not agree on exactly what the risks are, a lot of people who may you know, think, hey, this is, this is great to be moving forward now, have still been able to say, hey, but we might be wrong and different people disagree, so why don't we put measures in place to look for the risks and stop if we see them and keep going if we don't? Or keep going if we do see the risks, but we've got our protections in place by then, for example, good security. Yeah, I, I think it might be worth uh, taking a beat um, to think about maybe why it is that folks in this room, other rooms, aren't feeling quite as worried as you are. I would, you yeah. know, for what it's worth, I would put my, myself on the side of somebody who's like reasonably worried about everything that, that you've just described. And I know that one reason why, before I started doing a lot of reading and started talking to a lot of people like yourself, that I wasn't worried is that I, just as a human being, have a very poor understanding of exponential change, right? Like my mind can sort of only think in linear changes. But when you look at the difference between GPT-2 and GPT-4, which was a process that unfolded over only two years, you get this absolutely exponential change in capabilities, right? So what is it about these exponential changes that we human beings have such a hard time uh, preparing for and understanding? Well, I'm no expert on the psychology of exponential change, but well, I Well, that's why yeah. I want to talk to yeah, you. So sure. that's actually <laughs> really disappointing. Okay, yeah. oh, well, I'll get out of here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, you know, I think, I, I do have a couple things to say. I mean, one, I, I do remember with, with COVID that there were, you know, there were people early on saying, hey, look at the rate this thing is growing. And a lot of other people saying, who cares? I don't see anything around me changing. And when things change, they change extremely fast. And I, I do think of AI as potentially kind of a slow motion version of that, um, where you, you can, if you're really extrapolating the change right, it, it at least leaves a lot of room for concern. I think it's, it's debatable. Another thing I'll say, though, is that I'm, I'm concerned about a, a super exponential regime. So if you had AIs that were automating the full stack of AI research itself, the standard result for there would be would be something quite a bit faster than exponential and, and quite a bit scarier, in my opinion. So that that is some of some of my concern. But again, like I don't I don't think it's a sure thing that we're in trouble. I think it's a possibility. If it were up to me, we would be very c conservative and move cautiously. But I have tried to work on things that can appeal to a broader coalition than that. Yeah, I just underline what you're saying. It's like, you know, right now we have to rely on human beings having ideas and inventing things and figuring things out and researching things to move the world forward. Yep. And that's why it moves forward at a very linear pace. It is relatively easy to imagine a world where that just stops being true, where the computer does all the research and all the inventing, and it can do that at an ever faster clip. Is that right? That's right. And, and a key point is you would have a separate kind of feedback loop. So classically, if you have sure. innovations, the innovations lead to more output, more efficiency, and then the more efficiency means you have more resources. If you can plow the more resources back into more ideas, you get this super exponential loop. And, and that loop arguably did happen at times with humans in the past, but doesn't happen now because when we have more resources, that doesn't really lead to having more humans. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have kind of humans have ideas. Ideas mean there's more resources. More resources does not mean there's more humans. That part of the loop isn't, isn't in operation. Um, with AI, it could be. Because with AI, you, you have, you know, you, you very simply, if you just had a cluster and you use the cluster to do some you know, automated AI research that found more efficient algorithms that doubled the efficiency of what you're doing, now you have twice the cluster size. Now you can use that to do twice as much research as you did before. If that gets you another doubling, it's a very different kind of feedback loop from, from even, even the scary feedback loops that are exponential. This is, a, this is super exponential. Right. Let's talk about something else that you're really concerned about, which is cybersecurity in general. Yep. Right? Like a, a good scenario would be that the companies who are building this technology uh, are being relatively responsible with how they're developing it. But no matter how responsible they are, if they cannot protect their models, that could lead to other harms. Right? So, so what, what is your interest in cybersecurity? Yeah, generally, it seems, again, this, this is downstream of me believing that AI could quickly go from, you know, kind of funny, like GPT-2, to very cool and amazing and useful, but not particularly scary, like the, the GPT-4 we see today, hard to say where, how that's going to evolve in the future, to the, you know, to something that, that potentially could be extremely powerful, extremely high stakes. Maybe it could have implications for bioweapons development. Maybe it could have automated R&D. Maybe it could lead other weird places. And in that last category, I think that could be an AI that, that becomes of interest to espionage 
programs. And if, you know, if what we want is for countries like the U.S. to have the lead in powerful technologies, then we, what we shouldn't want is a bunch, of, a bunch of companies building very, very powerful systems that are kind of sitting there waiting to be stolen by geopolitical rivals. I think it would be extremely hard and take a very long time to get information security to the point where, where you could actually have one of these models be safe from that kind of theft. And I think that's something that, as a precautionary principle, would be good to be working on today uh, because we don't know if or when we're going to get there and could really regret it if we're kind of leaving the model weights in an easy-to-steal place. Based on the conversations you've had with folks, how seriously are AI developers taking this problem? It's a little hard to say, and, and anything I did know and said would probably be stuff I shouldn't, shouldn't be saying. I mean, I think, I think generally people recognize that this is an issue. People at these, at these companies that are trying to build state-of-the-art systems, you know, they, I mean, if you ask them what they're doing, they believe they're building something powerful enough that it would be a catastrophe if it was stolen by a state actor, and it would be of interest to a state actor. So the model is there, the belief is there. In terms of, you know, I won't, I won't say what people are or aren't doing, but I'll say that in terms of what it would look like to run a company that would be really hard to penetrate for that kind of well-resourced actor, that would be that would be very intense, and I think would would have would be kind of a rough, frankly, a rough place to work relative to your average tech company, and so it's definitely a heavy lift. All right, uh, we only have a few minutes left. I have just a couple more questions for you. One is about kind of the state of regulation so far. Uh, this month, President Biden put out an executive order uh, that place what I would call very gentle uh, restrictions on companies. If you build a new frontier model of a certain size, you have to tell the government, you have to tell them about what safety testing you did. What did you make of that order and what else would you like to see government doing in this realm? Sure. Um, I'm not a policy expert and I mostly, you know, I, I do focus a lot more on just like, for example, responsible scaling policies, things companies can do. That's something I just know a little bit better. I, I felt broadly positive about the executive order. I think it's a good thing to just start gathering awareness, gathering information about these extremely large training runs. The training run, you know, the, the compute threshold they set, I mean, we're probably looking at AI systems that are that are going to cost in the near future hundreds of millions of dollars to train, if not more. You know, so I think it's it's comparable to something like aircraft or drugs, which are heavily regulated. And I actually think uh, you know AI is is quite a bit more more uh, high stakes than those. And maybe uh, maybe we'd be happy to see less regulation of aircraft and drugs uh, and and more of AI. So it seems healthy to at least start collecting this information, knowing where there's massive training runs are, having you know collecting stuff about them. I would have loved you know I'm I'm really excited about conditional red lines, pre-specified stopping points or points where you need to have certain protections in place. And it would have been awesome to see something about that, but I think it's a good start. All right, and you know, for my last question, uh, for you know, folks in the crowd who, who may have been persuaded by your remarks, which I will assume is most people in this room. Re yeah, uh, <laughs> do we want to re Let's not re -pull. Let's wait until there people are drinking until we re okay. For those people, though, it, let's say they're like, okay, hold on, you've, you, you've raised some really good points here. What? Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying that they said, ah. let's, let's imagine that they yeah. said that. Okay. Uh, and they want to do something. What, what can average people, is there a role here for, and, and actually, let's not even say average, but let's say that like the technologists in this room who are building companies who are working on these issues, are there practical steps they can take to just build a, a better, safer world? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially if you're working in tech and you're working in, you know, industries near AI, I mean, any, any, you're probably having some sort of interaction with people who are making a contribution to building very powerful high stake systems. You may be a customer, uh, you may be an employee, you may be a potential employee. So I, I actually think just the very simple measure of visibly, audibly caring about this stuff and saying, hey, do you believe these are real risks? Have you worked out where your red lines are? Have you worked out, is there ever a place where you would say these systems are too powerful for our current state of information security? We need to prioritize security, not capability improvements for the time being. I think just asking that question and then operationally caring about it, I mean, just, you know, everyone's got choices about where to work and who to, you know, who to be a customer of and all that stuff. But I think even, even just expressing it, I think would go a long way. I mean, it's, it sounds kind of, uh, it sounds kind of lame, but I actually think that uh, people just visibly being concerned about this stuff does make a very big difference. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, that is all the time we have. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Silicon